Hi everybody, uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I get a lot of questions about tuning and uh, lots of emails, lots of messages. People send me pictures of you know their groups as, as they're tuning and ask me for my opinion. And uh, it's difficult to be able to respond to everybody. Um, everybody has their own unique circumstance. Uh, usually uh, the information included in the message uh, doesn't have all the information that I'm looking for uh, to be able to provide advice. So uh, I'm going to make this general video and the purpose of it is just to be able uh, to send a link to people who are wondering about tuning and how it's done. And I will show you that here in this video and hopefully this will help you as you move along with your tuning and get a great tune. All right, first things first, and that is that you really need to have high quality components. That is the key. Uh, having components that are old, worn out, rusted, um, just for whatever reason, have some you know issue um, and are not high quality and well built and well assembled, are going to demonstrate poor tune, and that's. And pretty much universal. So you really have to make sure that you have really great components, uh, good action, a good high quality barrel. There are some barrels that you're never going to squeeze better than a half MOA out of them. Heck, and with some of them, you won't even squeeze a one MOA out of them. And uh, so having high quality um, equipment is very important. Your scope is very important. There are scopes that move. <laughs> There's the reticle will move. Uh, making sure that your parallax is adjusted appropriately is another big thing when you're shooting groups and uh, you know trying to develop a, a good, well-tuned load. Um, how your scope is mounted is also a big deal. You have to really look at those screws, make sure they're making full contact with the counter bore of whatever it is you're using, uh, um, whatever kind of scope rail you're using. Making sure that your rings are straight. Uh, there's tools out there to, you know, you can put inside some rings and mount it and see if your rings are straight. There are a lot of techniques that people use to straighten out their rings. Um, some companies even have rings that have little sleeve inserts that help you sort of center it. Um, most really high quality companies now using, you know, high tech CNC machines, things like that are producing very tight tolerance, high quality uh, materials. And uh, so most of the modern day stuff right now is looking pretty good in terms of quality. But you have to make sure that you have that quality. You have to make sure that the rifle itself is very well assembled. Uh, so having a really good reputable gunsmith, look at, look it over top to bottom uh, is very important. Uh, there's you know issues with you know, how the action is placed into the stock, uh, all kinds of different things. And so having a really high quality, reputable gunsmith is, is a, a critical uh, thing too. Um, I realize many people don't have access and, you know, I understand that, but um, doing your best to make sure that your components are, are assembled really well. Uh, action screw torque, you know, having a torque wrench that could, you know, give you uh, very reliable torque readings and making sure that uh, you know your action is screwed into spec. There's all kinds of things so you have to really make sure you're paying attention to that before you go and attempt to uh, tune a load and if you don't and some things are sloppy or a scope is a bad scope it's moving and whatnot um, then, then you're just going to probably end up extremely frustrated uh, and not really, you know, sort of find the tune that you were you were hoping for. Okay, so the the method for tuning can vary quite a bit. I've seen people do ladder tests. Um, I've seen people do very slow load development where they start with a super low pressure load and start working their way up slowly, little by little. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of different techniques and um, the technique that I've landed on is what's called the known load technique. It's, I do have a video on my YouTube about it. In a nutshell, the simplest way to explain it is start with a range of loads that are pretty well known you know, in your region with your powder you're using, with your bullet you're using. 
your cartridge, your chamber dimensions, all those things. Uh, use a load that has already, you know, shot well. So, for example, here in the Pacific Northwest, you know, if we're shooting, uh, let's say, a 6 PPC cartridge uh, with, you know, certain chamber dimensions, and we're using uh, N133 powder, that's a pretty standard powder for the 6 PPC, a lot of people use it. Uh, we know that there are sort of known ranges of good places to start your load development. So, you know, 28.8 to 29.4, there's probably going to be, you know, pretty good tune window there. Uh, 29.7 to 30.2, there's probably going to be a tune window in there. And that's a, those are good places to start. You know, if it's a really hot, hot, you know, summery day, you might want to start with the, the lower node, the 28.8, and start there. Uh, if it's nice and cool and it's, you know, 40 degrees out, well, then you could start with the 29.7 and work your way up, right? Um, so these are just some strategies that you take in the known load method. Uh, additionally, using, you know, high quality bullets is, is a really uh, important thing. Um, and some bullets, you know, are really good out of the box um, and don't need any kind of sorting. Um, some bullets aren't, and it's advisable that you sort based on overall length, uh, especially when you're getting into the larger chambers, larger bullets, the 105 grains, the, you know, 175s, 197, 200s, 230s. Uh, it's good to sort those by overall length. Um, and then finding out with that particular bullet, what is the known good seating depth? I mean, some bullets, it's, you know, pretty obvious, you know, seat this at touch or just off touch is the ideal. Some bullets, you got to jam them a lot and give them a lot of neck tension. And, and, and so, you know, starting the load off with those things, high neck tension, jamming quite a bit. Uh, with a known powder charge range will probably get you a pretty precise uh, and, and really good tune window. Um, and so that's the method that I use is the known load method. And it has yielded the best results out of any method that I've used thus far. Okay, let's get to the good stuff. Let's look at some targets. All right, so in this situation, what I was doing uh, was loading a seven millimeter bullet in a 284 Winchester cartridge. And I was loading for a 600 yard uh, prone F-class shooting match using um, Alliant RL26 powder. And uh, at that time, the 197 grain Sierra Match King bullet did not really have any load data. And so I was kind of starting from a whole fresh perspective. I could not use my known load method, which is a, a method that I typically use when I go to uh, load, you know, do a load development. So I was kind of just left with a little bit of guesswork. <laughs> um, typically I use a known load method and I have good data and I'm able to land on a, a tune really fast. But for this one, not so much. But after talking to a few people uh, and, you know, asking around a little bit, it turns out the 197 Sierra Match King seemed to have shot well for them about 15 thousandths off the land and uh, off the lands and um, with RL26 what I knew about it from shooting it with my uh, 300 wind mag and my 338 Lapua looking at the size of the 284 Winchester cartridge I decided let's start at like around 54.2 grains and see what happens uh, other people that have used RL26 said yeah that sounds like a reasonable start so Went ahead and just loaded. Now notice how I loaded the powders, two tenths of a grain. Uh, you probably want to load them around two tenths of a grain or maybe three tenths. If you load them five tenths of a grain, you may inadvertently miss a tune window, a window where there are good groups. Uh, their shapes are very similar. Their point of impact is very similar and they, they look really good in terms of group shape and size. And uh, so that's what I did. And as you can see, the first, the first one, which is uh, 54.2, I had two that kind of clustered together, but then one kind of leak out. Uh, overall, again, you want to look at group shape. So what does the shape look like? 
and in this case it was not a really good looking shape it was um, you know kind of you had a lot of horizontal and kind of in a slanted way 54.4 um, shot another sort of uh, slanted shape okay so if you think about you know slanted shapes you got you know you're kind of clustering the groups are going in this direction together um, so pay close attention to that group shape because that signifies that there is not really a tune going on there okay um, 54.8 then once again showed that slanted shape pattern okay so i know now that 54.2 through 54.6 are not producing a good tune okay and then 54.8 i got a clover leaf pattern clover leaf tells me that the tune is starting to to do well i'm starting to see a good tune here okay uh 55.2 then the group shrunk quite a bit and now i'm looking at all three bullets and again i loaded three these are three shot groups i normally do three shot groups when i when i'm just doing exploratory stuff just seeing is there a tune window how are things going in general i don't want to waste five bullets when you know i know something is going to look out of tune with three and uh, anyway so yeah i've started shrinking and that's a you know good group and then um going to 55.4 uh, i'm sorry 55 I'm sorry, 55 was the one that shot the good group. And then 55.2 then shot a really small group. So um, that group made me think, hmm, I'm really kind of getting into a tune window here. And then I shot 55.4 and it shot two really tight and then one drop below, kind of like a, um, a, a clover leaf pattern, but with one drop in pretty low. And then finally, 55.6 was a clover leaf pattern, um, just a, almost the exact same as 54.8, except 54.8 had two on the bottom, one on the top. And interestingly, 55.6 had two on the top, one on the bottom, but still a clover leaf shape. So overall, looking at this overall pattern of groups is really what you need to do when you're doing low development. Look at the shape, look at the point of impact, look at the size. Those are really critical. The shape is going to tell you right away if the tune is bad. So 54.2 to 54.6, bad. We see that slanted shape pattern all day. That's going to be bad. 54.8, the clover leaf. Okay, it's starting to starting to tighten up. And then 55, 55.2, uh, even 55.4 showed very similar point of impact near that middle aim point um, and pretty small groups. So this is telling me that something within 55 and 55.2 uh, is the optimal tune window. All right, and also looking collectively at where your point of impact lies, notice way over here at 55.2 the point of impact was above the aim point stayed above the aim point went a little bit higher above the aim point stayed above the aim point and then dropped and then then after it dropped it kind of leveled out from 55 to 55.4 even to 55.6 it sort of leveled out it, it raised a little bit at 55.6 but you can see it's fairly level here in terms of point of impact so that makes me think 55 and 55.2 there's something going on there um the aim point the 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 aim point in terms of point of impact um is very similar the groups are small the shapes are relatively circular in size and so if i were to you know um, stop testing at this point i probably would land on 55.1 um, what I would normally do in this circumstance is I would load 5 at 54.9, 5 at 55, 5 at 55.1, 5 at 55.2, and 5 at 55.3, and probably 5 at 55.4, because that flyer there, you know, that could be something else going on. But I would load five rounds of each of those and shoot them all right next to each other, and then do this same analysis on those. Um, what I would expect to find is 
probably all of them would have very similar point of impact. All of them would have probably small groups and all of them would be relatively circular. Um, and that's how I would sort of complete load development. Okay, so that's it on a 284 win with 197 grain Sierra Match King using RL26 powder. Okay, um, I frequently get emails from people asking to provide an opinion on their loads during load development. That's difficult because I don't know what they're shooting exactly. I don't know if the rifle is very well built. I don't know if they engage in practices like I do. I weight sort my primer. I set them to you know a really good anvil compression in terms of their seating depth. Um, I do really good case prep. I anneal. You know, I, I do all kinds of things, and I have no idea whether they're doing it. I mean, typically it's it's <laughs> an email saying, "Hey, if you could please look at these groups, tell me what's going on." So I can't really assess whether their rifle, you know, is going to be performing at an optimal level. And so that's one of the major limitations that I have. And, and, and your rifle has to absolutely be performing at a great level. It has to be well built. It uh, has to, you know, be kind of flawless almost um, in many ways. So, um, but anyway, let's look at the target that this person provided to me. So again, this will tell you a lot. So you look at this. And there's that slanted shape once again. The groups are kind of all oriented in a slanted. Okay, see that? Another slant um, oriented in a slanted vertical manner. Um, and this person was doing a seating depth test with a 284 Winchester at 100 yards. And I forgot the powder they were using, but using 53.5 uh, grains uh, must have determined that that was somehow ideal for this cartridge and this bullet. But um, so at five thousandths off the lands shot a pretty small group but it does still have some horizontal but if you look at um you know the fifteen thousand twenty thousandths off the lands um you're getting these these sort of you know again vertical angular sort of groups um here at ten thousandths off the lands you get another angular sort of group here at fifteen thousandths it's just complete vertical 20 thousandths, another sort of angular, 25 thousandths, another, another angle vertical, 30 thousandths angle vertical. Um, this one is pretty much straight horizontal, angle vertical, angle vertical. Finally get a clover leaf at 50 thousandths, and then 55 thousandths is pure vertical. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't think I showed you those. There we go, yep. So angle vertical, a little clover leaf, and then pure vertical. So. Here, this is telling me that even over a range of different seating depths, which, by the way, I don't recommend only testing seating depths to five thousandths. Um, if I was testing a seating depth test, I would definitely not go above three thousandths. OK, so um, that's generally what I do, because if I go five thousandths, I'm, I might miss a tune window. And um, so, but anyway, um, just given that fifty thousandths had a clover leaf, that's probably the most promising area. Um, that, that, you know, this shooter may want to explore and that's feedback that I gave to that person is maybe load this with 47 uh, thousandths off the lands, 50 thousandths off the lands, 53 thousandths off the lands, 55 off the lands. Again, that flyer, who knows, you know, that, that could be something else, but definitely try 55 again and then maybe 58 thousandths and shoot those and see what happens. Um, I'm not sure, you know, we'll see if this user sends me, um, the targets again, um, uh, after testing that, but I absolutely would be curious because overall though, this overall pattern of groups is telling me that there might be some disturbance in, in the whole setup, like something may be going on with the rifle. That's not good. Maybe the barrel doesn't really particularly like that bullet. I've had situations like that where some barrels just will not shoot with a certain bullet and another barrel with the same chamber will. Um, and even powders, like this may be a barrel that really doesn't like whatever powder this is. I've had barrels that absolutely did not like a whole bunch of powders and only liked one, only shot well with one particular powder. So these things are absolutely possible when you're tuning. And uh, so that's why it's always good. I typically will have 
um, at least one alternate powder and at least one alternate bullet to try. And those are, those are good practices for when you're tuning because if I got something like this, I probably would go back to the drawing board and see if there's a tune window somewhere in here. Um, but if I got groups like this, where you see again, those slanted verticals, um, I pr probably would just scrap the, either the bullet or the powder and try something else at that point. Okay, before we move on to the next target, I wanted to go back to this target. As I said, very hard to establish whether there's a good tune window going on here. Many, many groups with that vertical slant shape, um, even with seating depths that only vary by 5,000. Um, and so I had fed back to the user, hey, I think there's something going on with the rifle, or we just have the wrong powder or the wrong bullet. Um, and I, I told them, you know, take a look at the rifle, make sure everything is into spec. Uh, action screws are torqued appropriately. Uh, you know, trigger is clean, you know, anything. It just seemed like there was something going on, something disturbed with the rifle. Try a different scope, whatever it may be, um, before we move on to a different powder. And uh, he went ahead and did that. He actually swapped out his scope. And what he showed me was that <laughs> the bottom two groups here were with the scope that he used to shoot this, this, this target. And then when he changed the scope, he shot these top two groups. And so he showed the difference between the two groups shot with the scope that's probably moving a little bit. And you can see that vertical slant shape. And then you can see here, where the two that he shot, same powder, same bullet, same rifle, just all he did was swap out the scope for a different scope, and bam, the, the groups circled up really nicely. And those are two five-shot groups on the top. So that's a, a good lesson to learn, that when you see you know, patterns like this and you're not really sure if there's a tune window, or maybe you do get a little tune window, but then you go to confirm it, and all of a sudden you see the vertical slant shapes, assuming there's no major change in atmospherics or the wind wasn't howling that day. Um, definitely take a look at your equipment and see if your equipment is functioning properly. Um, oftentimes, you know, we'll suggest go ahead and try a different scope. Um, and I've had that happen where I'll be at a match or something. Someone will be, sh will be shooting and they're getting patterns like this. And hey, let me try a different scope. Okay, here I got the scope laying around. Go ahead and try that. And then all of a sudden, the target dots up really well. So, um, in, in the case where your components are your rifle and scope and everything else is working, you know, up to spec, it should be just fine. Uh, you tried a different scope, nothing's changed. Um, then I would try a different powder at that point to see if a different powder does the job. If it doesn't, then I would try a different bullet but um, I would make sure you try that different bullet with the two different powders that you tried. And that's one strategy to take, but okay. So on to the next target. Uh, this was N130, 30 caliber, 30 BR was the chamber. And I used the PRP bullets, the Voodoo bullets. Um, they're seven Ojive, uh, 115 grain bullets. Um, high quality, hand swaged, uh, some of the best 30 caliber bullets I've ever shot, uh, flat base bullet. Um, in a 30 BR, I pretty much know that jamming that bullet quite a bit is going to be an ideal situation. And so I started off right away just jamming them 20 thousandths. Um, and uh, using N130, I knew we're going to, using the known load method again, I knew that we were going to find you know, some kind of tune going on in between 34 and, you know, 36. So I started with loading five with 34, four, five with 34, six, and five with 34, eight, five with 35, five with 35.2. Um, <clears throat> set the neck tension really tight. That's another thing. These bullets like a lot of jam and they also like a lot of neck tension. So I set the neck tension around three to 4,000, somewhere in that range. And uh, as you can see, the 34, four shot pretty good. Um, it was a, about a, you know, quarter MOA, so not great, but pretty good. Uh, 34.6, I had a flyer, so you see now I'm getting that sort of vertical stringing pattern. 34.8 um, shot extremely well. 
and then 35 I did have one little leak out to the left and then 35.2 okay so here you have it where you know there's probably a tune window going on over here with everything having kind of very similar point of impact small groups here um, and so I decided to go ahead and try out you know 34.8 and 35.2 to see you know are these two going to be any major differences so I loaded five of or I'm sorry I loaded 10 of each and shot um, two five shot groups of each with the 34.8 charge uh, got a got a little bit of a slant there a little bit of a clover leaf so once again the little slant the little clover leaf tell me hmm maybe not um, you know a good tune maybe it's just barely getting into tune but with 35.2 both of them dotted up really nicely and I got a 0.182 and a 0.158 so um, that's my process for confirming you know is taking a look at the target saying okay I think I've got you know somewhat of a tune window going on here between 34.8 and 35.2 but I'm going to go ahead and, and, and shoot both of them and shoot not only one five shot group or no three shot groups at this point at this point it's all five shot groups and uh, definitely they differentiated there the 34.8 did not perform as well as the 35.2 so i stuck with the 35.2 and actually did really well in a competition uh, the next weekend so it seemed to to have held uh, its tune and done and did really well okay here is another target this was out of a 6 PPC, very well-built rifle, uh, shillin barrel, 13 and a half twist, using N133 powder. And a, um, it was a prototype bullet that the bullet designer sent to me to you know, ask the question, uh, will this bullet shoot? What seems to be ideal characteristics with this bullet? Okay. So what I ended up doing was, is I knew looking at the bullet, you know, how the grainage of it, the type of barrel I was using, powder I was using. Using the known load method, I knew that the powder charges within 29.9 and 29.8 grain, that I'd probably find something, you know, really good there. And so that's essentially where I started. And I just decided I'm going to test seating depths with those two powder charges, because I'm pretty sure those two powder charges will do well. But I want to see with this bullet, typically the bullet profile in a barrel like this in the chamber that I have, um, typically uh, will shoot good if it's just barely into the lands, a couple thousands into lands, sometimes when it's just touching the lands, and sometimes where it's just barely off the lands, two thousands off the lands. So this is how I set it up. I loaded up five rounds of each, and I went ahead and... Um, I shot some fowlers, as you can see above. Those were fowler shots, just getting the barrel fouled up. Um, and then at 29.9, two thousandths into the lands, a pretty good group. I mean, it was a 253 with some vertical, so not terrible, not great. I'm certainly not going to settle on that. And with 29.8, two thousandths into the lands, the group got much larger. In fact, I didn't even measure it because I knew it was just way too big. Okay, so then I went down to uh, touch and shot the 29.9 at touch, and that showed a good clover leaf and 0.181, so a small clover leaf group. These are five shot groups, by the way. And then the 29.8 showed some horizontal at a 315, so pretty big group, horizontal. Okay, and then went down to 2000s off the lands. And with 29.9, you can see how, <laughs> look at the progression. So a little bit of vertical starts forming into a nice little circular group. So it goes from a 253 with vert to 181 with a nice circular shape down to a low one with a very circular shape. Okay, so that's the progression that you want to see on your target when you're doing variations on seating depth is... Is it going from these verticals, possibly vertically slanted shape groups to the clover leaf to the small group? Okay. Um, 29.8 just ended up not really shooting well at all. And uh, you can see, once again, you know, a little bit of a vertical um, 
slant, a little bit of a vertical slant on that one. So anyway, um, went back to the bullet developer and said, definitely this bullet likes to be, you know, it could be on touch to just off the lands um, with a pretty stout load. You know, 29.9 is a pretty stout load. I did, I typically don't go above 30.2 because it just gets, you know, pretty hot at that point. So, um, and this is for the cooler months where I live, um, typically in the range of like 40 to 55 degrees, um, a stout load will work well. Um, if I had to shoot this in uh, 60 plus degrees, I would probably shoot 29.4. I'd usually, usually have to go down half a grain in this cartridge to get the tune back because for whatever reason in the atmosphere I live in, once it's past 60 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, the tune falls and it gets really, you know, uh, high pressure with loads that are, you know, stout like this. And so dropping about half a grain uh, is typically what, what I do. So th that's the progression that you want to see, you know, okay, we see some slanted vertical, turns into a clover leaf, and then turns into a small dot. Okay, for this next target, I was, um, is a brand new barrel, brand new shillin barrel, um, six PPC chambering, 13 and a half twist, and um, I was low developing for a rifle that I um, added a Izel a PDT particle dampening technology tuner to and this was my initial workup I had broken the barrel in uh, with some uh, what are called second bullets bullets that probably aren't going to perform well and broke it in and then decided okay I need to start with low development and with this one I used LT32 powder with 6 PPC does extremely well so it's a really good powder and then I used really high quality hand swaged Ventress bullets. And um, I knew, again, for this particular bullet, I knew where it would perform really well. So I set the bullet where I knew it would perform really well. I also knew the range of charges that I probably would find a tune window were going to be somewhere around 26.8 up to 28.2. I knew that going above 28.2 is getting a little on the on the hot side, so I wanted to find more of a medium pressure sort of load. And so I went ahead and, again, loaded uh, 5 with 26.8, 27, 27, 27.2, 27, 27.4, 27, 27.6, 27, 28, uh, 28, 28.2, etc. Okay, so just, again, two-tenths of a grain because I knew there's going to be a tune window in there and um, I don't want to load five tenths of a grain and miss a tune window. And so went ahead and shot, shot the groups and um, 26.8 performed really well. Um, 27, once I saw this, again, the slanted vertical, I mean, once that thing shows up, that's a good indicator that there's not going to be a good tune. So what I did essentially was I only shot two shots. I did not want to, you know, continue wasting good bullets, good powder. Uh, once I saw that pattern developing on, you know, with 27, I just didn't shoot the rest. Went to 27.2, saw the same pattern. Once again, thought, mm, not going to shoot the rest. I'm going to save those bullets. And then um, 27.4 is started shrinking up pretty good. So I thought, all right, I may be entering into a good tune window here. 27.6 then shot really small once again. Uh, 27.8, again, I shot two and there was too much horizontal in the shape at that point and I stopped shooting those basically. Um, and then 28 shrunk again. A little bit of horizontal, not a whole lot. That group was 0 0.1005, so very respectable, good group, but a little bit of vertical and then a little bit of vertical on 28.2. So, Looking at this target, I thought, all right, I'm probably seeing something in the realm of 27.4 and 27.6, something in there. This is probably my tune window for this particular bullet barrel and powder combo. So I went ahead and actually just settled on loading to 27.5, and that actually worked uh, extremely well. And we will see some targets here shortly um, to show you um, how well it worked when I did my tuner test. Okay, so 
That's the thing with tuners though, even though this was a rifle that I put a tuner on, what I normally do is I twist the tuner all the way in and then twist it out about a quarter to a half a turn. And then I do my load development at that point. Okay, I do not load develop with turning the tuner. That is not how you use a tuner. Um, how you use a tuner is turn it all the way in, turn it out about a quarter to a half a turn, and then begin your load development and get a really good load before you start testing the tuner. That's the key. Okay, so here in a second, we'll see how it did with the uh, tuner test. Okay, so now that I have the load developed, the 27.5 uh, LT32 seemed to have been the sweet spot, and I knew I was within a good tune window there, settling right in between uh, 27.4 and 27.6. I went ahead and loaded several bullets, all the same bullets, all the same seating, uh, 27.5 powder, all of them, all the same primer, uh, same lot of brass and everything, and uh, made up this target because when you do a tuner test what you're looking for is uh, what's called a sine wave you're looking for shifts in the point of impact of on the on the target and you so you want a nice straight line and you want standardized dots uh, in particular areas that are you know in a standardized distance from each other and so i made this target just for that um, i made two lines because i figured if i had some ammo left over uh, if I found what I would consider a sweet spot in the tune, I was going to see if I can confirm that, okay? And so, um, like I mentioned, turn the tuner all the way in and then turn it out about a quarter to a half a turn. And that landed me on tuner setting 22. Now, however your tuner settings are set for this particular tuner is probably not going to be the same as mine. Um, it just so happened that 22 was, you know, about a quarter to a half of a turn out, and that's the number it was on. So... What I did there is I put my aim point right on the dot and I did that for the entire test and fired uh, several three shot groups, okay? So you can see from um, setting number 22, is that a great tune? No, you can see, what, what do we see? We see exactly what signifies that it is not necessarily a good tune. You see the slanted uh, sort of, well, you definitely see a slanted, uh, horizontal, um, some vertical. Okay, setting them, then I turn the two, let the barrel cool, turn it to 23. Once again, I see, you know, that slanted pattern and lots of horizontal, some vertical. Aim point is the same. Both the groups shot in relatively same point of impact, but you can see their slanted, their slants are different angles. So that's telling me no good. The tune, tune's not good there. So then I shot 24, and that dotted up really well. Um, that was a .1225, so um, look, looking, looking pretty good. Maybe that's the start of a good tune. I don't know. We'll see. Let the barrel cool, go and shoot 25, and then boom, what do I get? <laughs> I get the slant pattern again. Um, point of impact was about the same. Um, and then I shot 26, and you can see there, 26 got a pretty nice small dot. So that was, um, you know, that looked promising. Once again, I thought this may be the beginning of, of a tune window. I don't know, but you can see it comes the next, you know, the next hash mark 25 um, had that um, horizontal slant, um, horizontal some vertical slant. Um, and you can also see too where the point of impact now dips low. Okay, so this is where the sine wave it starts to develop. You can see it kind of almost flat there, but then you can see it dipping a little low here on 25, and then it dips low, way low on 26. Okay, so you can clearly see where it's going sort of flat, dipping down a little bit, and then it dips even further down. So now I go to 27, and similar point of impact, a little bit to the right, a little bit of horizontal, not much. Still a 1, 0.133. All right, and then I fire 28. 28 is showing a very small clover leaf um, design. So again, now I'm thinking I'm getting into tune here. Um, I can see the clover leaf forming. That's great. I shoot 29. It shoots a tiny little dot. So that's a really good sign. Um, that group measured 0, 0.735 inch, so um, really small. I fire 30, and I get a flyer. Uh, these two go boom, boom, right into the same hole, 
and then bam, I get a, a flyer to the right. Um, am I terribly concerned? Not, no, not yet. No, let's see, keep going. 31, small, 0.128, but you get a little, you could see the little slant effect. Okay, and then I shoot zero and one, and I get another flyer. Um, so I, the first two went into one hole and then the one other went high. So the, the sine wave curve could be dipping down right now. I'm not sure because of that flyer. Um, and then I shot setting one and a little bit of horizontal, but not a whole heck of a lot. 0 0.1715, not terribly concerning. So uh, when you're doing tuner tests, the key is to sort of look at your entire target, look at the group shapes of it, look at the sine wave and uh, pick a spot that seems to be sort of flat in the curve with a circular um, or you know small clover leaf uh, pattern which in this case seemed to have been somewhere between you know 26 and 31 all right so that's where i thought okay it's pretty flat there you can kind of see when you put the pen down on it that it's pretty flat. Point of impacts are about the same. Group sizes are all in the ones. 29 was a zero. Um, 30 did have a flyer, but again, uh, <laughs> flyers just occur. You know, it could have been that the barrel wasn't fully broken in yet. I'm not sure, but um, again, not too terribly concerned. So I shot 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30 again. This time I didn't have a whole lot of ammo left, so I counted my ammo and I thought, well, I'm only going to be able to get two, two shots on each, which is not ideal. Um, I do recommend doing these tests again with three, a minimum three shots, but that's all the ammo I had. So, And you can see where it did sort of line up again. I mean, it had the same sort of straight line trajectory um, but the cool thing too was 29 showed another tiny little dot and it was surrounded by other two other tiny little dots. So that made me think something is going on there with 29. It seems to be performing well and it seems to be surrounded by groups that, you know, are, are okay. They weren't, you know, they weren't huge by any means. Those are very competitive groups. So I went ahead and on a different day, um, same atmospheric conditions, same temperature, uh, same level of humidity, same level of barometric pressure. I went ahead and I loaded for um, three rounds for each tuner setting, 26 through 31, because I wanted to see is this really, you know, the flat spot here in the sine wave and are the groups going to remain small. And as you can see, 27 through 30 did shoot really flat. Um, they were all pretty small groups. Um, Shapes were okay. This one did have a little flyer, but otherwise the shapes were were circular. That was a tiny clover leaf, but but tuner setting twenty nine really was circular throughout the entire test. I mean, if you look at twenty nine, it's circular, circular, and then twenty nine here circular, and then a zero. So that told me that yep, this is probably the tune window right here, twenty seven through thirty. I'm probably going to get my best precision there. And so I did set the tuner at 29 and uh, went out the next day in very different uh, barometric pressure. Um, what I have found in my atmosphere where I live is that, you know, shifts in temperature and humidity from, you know, 30 degrees to 60 degrees, humidity from uh, 50 percent to 100 percent. Um, don't really tend to affect precision much. But what does affect precision in my atmosphere is barometric pressure. So if I see a barometric pressure shift from, you know, like I did low development here when the pressure was, you know, somewhere in the 30 range, which is a high pressure. Um, I took it out when the pressure was 29.55. So once it dips below 29.7, that is very significant. That's a pretty big drop. And what I found with testing that I've done on two other tuners um, is that those two other tuners that I've used, the Dan Bramley DSB and the Eddie Harris tuner, um, is that all I need to do is turn it one hash mark inward and um, I can regain the tune, all right? So what I ended up doing was I loaded a bunch of ammo Went, went to the range that day when the barometric pressure was really low 
temperature was about the same humidity level was about the same as when i did low development i did the tuner test so those didn't vary um and uh, you know those didn't vary a whole lot barometric pressure did and what i found was with tuner setting 29 after i shot a five shot group look at the pattern that i got <laughs> it is in the, it is a poor tune pattern where you know again you have that vertical slant group okay and then i went and i sh turned the tuner i let the barrel cool a little bit turned the tuner out a little bit and i'm sorry i turned the tuner one hash in from setting 29 to 28 and all of a sudden boom small dot it it uh, dotted up it was a 0.156 group so small group and uh, so then I went down to the next target. I left the setting on 28, fired it again, another five shot group, and shot another 0.113. Then I went and I changed the setting to 29, and what did I get? I got another sl vertical slanted pattern. All right, and then I kept it on 29, and I did get a flyer. So that was upsetting. I, it looked like it was shaping up to be a tiny, tiny group. But then all of a sudden, I get a flyer, which gives me that slanted pattern. And I turned it, let the barrel cool again, turned it back to 28, and it dotted back up to a tiny 0 0.0955. Okay, then I went, turned it to 29 again, and then I got this pretty large slanted pattern, uh, almost a half MOA group, so super big group. Went back, turned it to 28, and the group shrunk again. It was a little bit bigger than the other groups, um, but um, still a lot smaller than this target. So on average, when I had uh, checked out the averages and ran a statistical analysis, I actually found that there was a huge statistically significant difference between Tudor setting 28 and 29 that... Um, the aggregate of all those groups for um, when I turned the tuner from 29, turned it inward to setting 28, the mean aggregate was 0.1665, and the variance of, of that aggregate was really low, small variance. Um, for setting 29, it was almost double the size. I mean, it, it, it just, the groups got really big. Variance was still small, but the group size really doubled, and um, it was not a chance finding. It was definitely a, a legitimate, uh, statistically significant finding. So that is the lesson to be learned, that you may have an ideal tuner setting that shows it's in a good tune window, it's shooting really small and circular, and um, all of a sudden some atmospheric condition has a dramatic shift. Again, where I live, it's barometric pressure. Anything below 29.7 is a dramatic shift. So if I low develop and you know above 29.7 that's my high pressure tuner setting but once a low pressure system comes in i turn it one hash inward and it regains the tune and that to me is the major value um, in these tuners is that they allow me to regain tune when barometric pressure shifts and uh, so what i do you know now is i pay close, close attention to barometric pressure. I pay, pay attention to temperature, humidity, and other things, but definitely check out barometric pressure. And I use an app on my phone to check it out. It has a forecast feature that enables me to see throughout the day, are there gonna be shifts in barometric pressure? Um, looks like everything here on this day is gonna be above 29.7. Um, this everything here is probably going to be above 29.7. So it looks like for the upcoming week, um, the pressure is going to be pretty stable. But there are times where, you know, we'll start the day with a high pressure, but then we'll end the day with low pressure. And so um, knowing that going into the match and knowing when that, you know, pressure shifts from above 29.7 to below tells me, okay, I need to turn the tuner and regain my tune. Or... Uh, proactively turn the tuner expecting to lose a tune and wanting to keep it uh, when I go up to the line to shoot my uh, shoot my target. Okay well let's finish off this video with uh, looking at uh, once again a, a target that was sent to me uh, by somebody in an email said hey take a look tell me what you think and um, 
you know, again, this, I, I want to finish this video with, with emphasizing that if there is some kind of disturbance with your rifle, uh, your, your ability to show the typical pattern of shapes going from, you know, slanted verticals to clover leaf to a small circle uh, is going to be limited. And, or if you have a barrel that does just not like the powder for whatever reason, or does not like the bullet, or you, you have the wrong twist, I don't know what, it, whatever it may be. Um, it's going to be extremely difficult to establish a tune. So um, this person was using a 300 WSM chamber uh, 208 burger, and I forgot the powder, but uh, you can see the powder weights 64.3, 64.6. So this person decided to shoot three tenths of a grain, which, you know, that's that's OK. I, I tend to prefer two tenths of a grain, but this person wanted to do three tenths and that that's fine. I mean, that's acceptable. Um, but as you can see here, you know, um, 64.3 again, you know, you got a nice slant, 64.6, smaller dot, but you still have the slant, 64.9, it's kind of a clover leaf, but a larger one, um, 65.2, clover leaf, 65.5, you get the slant. So again, a target where it didn't really dot up, like we didn't really see that progression from you know, a slanted, you know, group into a clover leaf and then into a small dot. It just kind of went slanted, slanted, clover, clover, back to slant. Um, now that, you know, some people will just accept that at that point and just say 64.6, 64.9 and 65.2, there's something in there. And, and that's fair. I mean, you can certainly then what I would do is load 64.6, you know, 64.8, 65, 65, 2, I would probably go back to the drawing board, loading them in two tenths of a grain. But um, I'd be kind of skeptical as to whether that's really going to work. I mean, looking at this pattern uh, is telling me even even with three tenths of a grain difference that there's not really something clearly emerging here. You know, again, we should be able to see that slant, slant, clover leaf develop, clover leaf shrink and then a, a nice round dot. Um, we're not necessarily seeing that. We're seeing something that's pretty close though with the clover leaf development. Um, and so, you know, not too terribly bad, but I was still a little skeptical about that. Um, the user also sent me another uh, uh, target and asked for feedback on that. And um, this, these were cold bore shots, Fowler's. And then started the test running 42.9 grains. As you can see, some vertical, not much of a slant. Uh, 40 point, or I'm sorry, 43 point, uh, oh, that's 43. And then you can see a lot of vertical with just a slight slant. 43.1, again, some vertical with a slight slant. And then jump to 44, where you can now see a slant. Jump to 44.5. Another slant, 44.6, another slant, 44.2, another slant. Okay. Um, one of, so clearly no real tune window established here. This, this is definitely not seeing, you know, any good tune window. Um, one of the other problems is, is so the person only varied it by a tenth of a grain and obviously didn't really show much. Again, I recommend, you know, two tenths of a grain, um, but this person only did one tenth, one tenth and notice they jumped from 43.1 to 44. So there may have been something that could have got, you could have seen the tuning pattern at 43.3, 43.5, 43.7, 43.9. was if it was there, it was missed because of the significant jump from 43.1 to 44. And then they went five tenths of a grain from 44 to 44.5. So they may have actually missed something there too. Probably probably nothing though. I, I'm, I'm looking at all these slants and I'm thinking something's probably disturbed with this rifle. Um, or once again, just have the wrong powder or possibly the wrong bullet. Um, so jumping from you know, 44 to 44.5 to 44.6 and then 44.2. 
So um, actually this, <laughs> this target should have been over here. This person should have shot 44-2 here. And then um, over here, probably should have shot 44.4, and then probably should have shot 44.6 over here. So um, this target, I think, you know, tells me that you have to be very uh, planful in your target management. You know, you have to go in um, setting up your targets, setting up your ammo to, you know, shoot exactly what you want to shoot and and showing the progression okay that's that's the thing we want to see the progression of you know on the target so jumping you know uh jumping grain edges uh varying them by a lot and then by a little all of a sudden um not advisable putting grain edges on the target you know um that should have been over here is again not advisable because we don't get to see the pattern emerge. So notice with my targets how I start, you know, with 26.8, increase to, you know, two tenths, increase two tenths, increase two tenths, increase two tenths. There's a clear progression going on here, and then I can clearly see based on those, you know, where where is the tune window? You know, where is it dotting up? Is it the similar point of impact? And so. Um, Target management is another critical component to low development. So uh, keep that in mind, all right? Um, making sure that your targets are clear, there's a clear progression going on, and they're easy to interpret. So with this user, my feedback was, you know, yeah, I, I sent him one of my targets. I said, set up your targets this way so you can clearly see the progression. Uh, think about shooting two tenths. Um, you can shoot three tenths, that's fine, but think about shooting two tenths, but make sure the target shows a clear progression with all your work. And, um, you know, and then send me back some targets then, and let's take a look. Subsequently, uh, he did that and then sent me back the targets, and I noticed, you know, just a lot of vertical, uh, you know, again, the vertical slant. And my feedback to him was, I think there's something disturbed with the rifle. Um, take it take take a look at it uh, send it to a reputable gunsmith try a different scope um, if everything seems to be fine then um, let's set up a target that you know um, is clear as day in terms of your progression and we can easily visualize that you know reshoot reshoot what you think worked pretty good and then let's look at the target again okay um, that's what the user did but so target management is extremely important and when you're setting up your brass um, and uh, loading everything in your loading bin um, what I do is I have a sticker or I, or I tape all of my different loads here so I have a little line here five cider fowlers so if you look these were the five cider fowlers and then 42.5 is these five 43 is these, and I set my target up that way. <laughs> so I'll have a, a cider section, and then I'll show 42.5, 43, um, and uh, go ahead and do that. Um, and you may be thinking, well, Brian, you've been jumping here on the grainage. This actually was just for breaking in uh, to see at what point am I starting to establish a high pressure load. So I'm, I wasn't testing for precision on this necessarily per se, because you can see here where you know, oh, you, you went from 42.5 to 43, that's a big jump, and then 43.4, so your increments were not the same. That's because my purpose for this load was actually just to see at what point am I establishing pressure. Um, I did that because I was using a very old powder, and I was not sure 100% at which point was the pressure point, an old bottle of IMR 4064. So, um, so anyway, so you may do different grainages and set it up differently when you're doing things like just seeing at what point is there high pressure. Um, aside from that, if you're really doing load development for precision, again, I recommend two tenths of a grain. I recommend the load known load method where you know, okay, there's going to be a window here where we're probably going to see, you know, a really good tune. All right. Okay, quick segment on when to do load development. I mentioned before that atmospherics are very important with load development and that you can load 
you can develop a load in a certain atmosphere and it may not work in a different one and that's just the bottom line so um, definitely paying attention to atmospheric conditions tracking it like I showed you on my target I have a section where I write down all the atmospherics when I'm shooting I have an app where I look at you know uh, the atmospherics that are current I look at it you know okay if I'm going to be shooting for an hour and a half let's look at the you know forecast for that hour and a half and see if there's any shifts so I pay attention to that the second piece is wind <laughs> so your group shapes are going to vary considerably if uh, you're not paying attention to wind and there's wind conditions on the range so um, definitely wind is a major factor and it is even at 100 yards so uh, if you're really looking to develop an ultra precise load, um, developing it um, in stable uh, conditions is good, like a, a certain slight, you know, one mile an hour wind that's going in the same direction, the exact same uh, throughout your entire, let's say you're load developing at 100, 200 yards, 300, 600, whatever it may be, um, that's fine because you're going to have pretty much the same kind of force um, acting on the bullet, uh, bullet to bullet when you're shooting, you know, your five shot groups or, or uh, depending on how many groups you shoot. But um, if you have conditions though, where all of a sudden the direction of the wind starts changing, uh, it's go, you know, goes from left to right, or you have what's called wind switches where uh, one second it's kind of going this way and then bam, it just switches over to this side within a second. Um, those wind switches are definitely the worst. They're, <laughs> they will, you know, boom, within a, a millisecond, it's slanted the other way and, and the wind is going to push your bullet a different direction. So um, paying attention to the wind is a big thing. And so what um, some people have done is they've developed wind flags and there's really good reputable companies out there. Um, here I have what are the Graham wind flags. These are uh, very nice premium wind flags um, that are very responsive to really subtle uh, shifts in, in wind or air movement. Uh, very subtle. So this thing could pick up, you know, a quarter of a mile an hour wind. You know, if there's anything slightly breezing, you'll see this tail, you know, moving just so slightly. And you'll see this thing go in the direction of the wind and this could be angular too so you know you could have a complete 90 uh, you can have a 45 you can even have outgoing and incoming winds um, so that's another thing i like to do load development when it is really calm and i typically will put a few of these out in the field at particular distances so if I'm doing load development at 100, I definitely want one of these right by the bench. The data shows that the wind closest to you is going to have the biggest impact on the trajectory of that bullet. And so I do have a flag that's really close to me. And then I set the next one fairly close, maybe 25 yards out. And then I'll set the next one maybe to like 50 or 75. Um, that way I have some indication of what's going on with the wind. Um, typically when I do low development, it's when there's, you know, pretty much no wind or just very subtle, very small, uh, maybe quarter to half to one mile an hour wind. Um, now, what I do though is if I do low development in that condition, I also like to shoot in windy conditions as part of load development. I want to know that when this thing is going you know, five mile an hour wind that's going in this direction. When I fire that bullet, is it all, are all five of my group shots going in the same direction and having, you know, very similar point of impacts and are showing again that circular group shape. And so I do actually like to uh, confirm my load in fairly windy conditions, okay? Um, if the conditions are switchy, again, like, you know, going from, you know, right to left really fast, um, I won't consider that low development. I'll consider that I'm practicing, uh, you know, observing the flag and trying to get my timing to where I shoot the bullets in the exact same condition. So if it's switching like this to there and I shoot in this condition and then it just switches back to here, I stop. I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not going to shoot in that. But then once it switches right back, then
boom, go ahead and fire in that condition. So um, oftentimes in the range, my main range that I go to, um, switches are uh, very frequent. And again, I would not consider, you know, um, doing any kind of load development under those conditions. What I do is I consider it, I'm practicing. Um, so that's, that's my philosophy. There's a lot of other philosophies out there that say, you know, oh no, absolutely do your initial load development in, in wind conditions. Um, uh, I'm not a huge believer in that. I think, you know, I want to shoot it under fairly high pressure conditions with like no wind or maybe very, very little. Um, and if there is very, very little, I want to make sure it's very consistent where I'm seeing, you know, the tails moving and the flag in that same direction as I fire all five of my shots. Um, so anyway, and then I use windy conditions to either confirm that there is a good tune or to practice shooting in wind conditions. And um, oftentimes what I find is, you know, sometimes uh, you're saying, okay, I got a stable wind condition and I'm gonna go ahead and start my group. And you get down there, look in the scope, you're seeing it, you kind of can see the flag a little bit moving. And then all of a sudden you press the trigger and then you see the flag go like this. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, your point of impact where you expected it to go, it went a little bit left. Um, at that point, um, what you could do is either wait for it to go a little bit left or um, practice a holdover, which is where um, now it's going a little bit right. Go to a different target, fire, and see where the bullet lands, where the point of impact is. And okay, it's a little bit more to the right now. So if that right condition is staying and it's not going back to that initial left condition where you shot your first round, then estimate based on that. Okay, it looks like it's about, you know, three eighths of an inch to the right. So I'm going to go over now to the first bullet that I shot and hold it over about three eighths of an inch and fire. And uh, typically, again, if your rifle is in really good tune, uh, that bullet should should go in with the initial bullet and it should, you should form, you know, a good good group there but uh, so anyway yeah Im important to to track and monitor is wind um, sometimes like uh, you may not have flags and it's not common to have flags I don't see a lot of shooters at the range uh, using flags you can look at other indicators maybe there's vegetation on the side of the range maybe there's some grass you can see the blades moving there may be other indicators there for you to look at. You may even feel the wind, you know, sometimes I'll feel it on my back or I will feel it, you know, hitting my face. Um, you know, you can, you can definitely see if there's other indicators out there of wind conditions, but the premium and optimal uh, system for managing wind and knowing, you know, where wind is going while you're doing load development are flags like these. Well, all right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Uh -huh, get it? Tuning in. <laughs> um, I hope you uh, derive some benefit from this. It's, uh, you know, these are, I would say, ba a mixture of basic and advanced tuning methods. Uh, this information should get you going uh, pretty good. Again, like I said, major factors in tuning are making sure your rifle is very well built. Your components are working appropriately, correctly. Uh, there's no major issue with them. Uh, and then from there, you know, if you're like me, you can use a known load method to go ahead and, you know, get that uh, tune that, you you know, that uh, known load that'll get you a good tune almost right away and a, in a quick amount of time. Uh, definitely confirm that tune. Um, if you're shooting a tune window, uh, shoot it again. Uh, and then, you know, if you sort of verify that that tune window is still there and things are going well then i advise you definitely shoot some more five shot groups just to be double sure that it's a reliable tune um, also take take very um close pay close attention to atmospherics atmospherics are uh incredible they they impact tune quite a bit they also impact ballistics so changes in temperature and humidity could easily change the velocity um, what tends to change precision, though, is like barometric pressure. So keep an eye out on those variables. Um, some, you know, weather apps, you know, will enable you to um, look forward at the, you know, have a forecast feature in them. 
Um, I certainly pay attention to the forecast feature on mine. Um, so for example, this one is the one that comes with the standard iPhone. And let's say, you know, I hear on the news or whatever that a you know, weather system's coming in. I will click on the barometric pressure forecast and look, I can get a daily forecast. I can swipe it and find out, well, let's see on Thursday what's going to happen. And then I can see, okay, it's going to stay above 30. So I should have, you know, I'll use the tuner setting on this rifle, for example, this tuner of 29, because that's what works in high barometric pressure. But um, let's say, you know, oh, shoot, look. Here on Sunday, it's going to go down to 29.6. Um, that's where I'll then set the tuner to 28 because I know that that setting is good uh, for low barometric pressure. Um, if you're not using a tuner, again, you'll have to probably retune the load. So if you tune a load in a high barometric pressure situation and you know that that weekend, the match you're going to or you're shooting with your buddies at the range, whatever it may be, uh, the barometric pressure is going to drop significantly or some other atmospheric variable you believe is important is going to change dramatically, um, then you probably have to rework the load at that point to, you know, main, to you know, regain a tune or to anticipate the loss of a tune, you know, on that day or on that weekend uh, and make sure that you go into it, you know, um, expecting that you'll have a good tune. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. And again, uh, please uh, look at my Patreon page. There's lots of really good stuff on that page. Videos like this I do all the time that are not on my YouTube. So uh, we have a good learning community too. Lots of good shooters uh, sharing good information. And uh, uh, ultimately, everything that we do is geared towards uh, improving your shooting. And that's what we're all about. So all right, everyone. Shoot small. Take care.